So last week we looked at the subject of summoning the power of God and how we, the saints, through declarations and decrees, can release God's power. So when God speaks, ultimately when God speaks from His throne and releases a declaration or a decree from His throne, and then we are in agreement and we release that. Literally, God speaks through us, that we're releasing the voice of God. And we saw from Psalm 103 and also from other verses in the Bible that the angelic powers, they, they, they live to obey the Word of God. They heed the Word of God and they move when the Word of God is sent. And so when we are releasing what God says... Angel armies and angel ministers move. Mm, yeah. And that is how the power of God moves. The Holy Spirit himself will move according to the will of the Father. Yeah. We saw in the book of Daniel when uh, the archangel Gabriel uh, had entered into strategic level spiritual warfare over the, the empire of the Persians because Daniel was praying and interceding and fasting. And Gabriel was joined by Michael in holy war and Gabriel breaks through because they bound the demonic prince of Persia. And then Gabriel comes to Daniel and he says something very interesting. He says, Daniel, man highly esteemed, from the very first day you set your heart for understanding your prayer was heard and I have now come because of your words. Now, obviously, God sent Gabriel and sent Michael into spiritual war. God sent them, but because Daniel was in agreement and he was tuned in with the will and the purposes of God in his prayer, it was actually Daniel's words that released Gabriel from the throne room of God. So was it God? Yes. Was it Daniel? Yes. Okay, and so this is the thing that we're looking at in this teaching. It's not just that you start to decree things and angels move because you decided it's a good idea. We do need to tap into the heart of God yeah. and we've got to study the scripture and find out what is the will of God in situations. We've got to start to de declare his will uh, in agreement. And so there is a protocol to this. Um, but the, when you are saying what God says, the word that comes from you is the word of the Lord and the angels live to fulfill that word. Okay, so let's get into uh, today's teaching. We're going to start with Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. And we'll look at from verse 22 to 24. Now, by the way, I'll go back to verse 20 because it's significant with the testimony I just shared about the fig tree. Um, now, in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the very roots. And Peter remembered that Jesus had cursed the fig tree. He said, oh, teacher, look, the fig tree which you cursed is now withered up. So Jesus answered and he said to them, Have faith in God. Have faith in God. For truly I say to you, whoever would speak to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. And they do not doubt in their heart, but they believe that those things they say will be done. Then, And he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you've received them and you'll have them. And so you have faith in God. You do not doubt. You speak to the mountain and you believe in your heart that these things will happen and it will happen as you have now declared. Again, remember the protocol that I shared. Jesus only said what the Father says. And so we need to learn what's in the will of the Father 
It's your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, and so this is the, the context of this. But uh, there are mountains. And these mountains need to be conquered because these mountains oppose us in our forward progress in advancing the kingdom of God. These are mountains that come into our lives. Uh, these are mountains that come into cities and nations. They oppose uh, us individually and even as, as, a, as a, a community they will face us. And also our forward progress of seeing God's kingdom established in Australia. There are mountains that are challenges that lie before us. And I love the, the heart of Caleb. And it says that Caleb had a different spirit because all the other guys were freaking out with fear because they saw the demonic strongholds of the enemy. They saw the enemy was like giants and they compared themselves to the enemy and then they got fear. Never compare yourself to the enemy. Yeah. Caleb had faith. He compares the enemy to God and so the enemy doesn't know who he's messing with. Yeah. And that's faith. It's not self-confidence. It's God-confidence is faith. Yeah, right. Self-confidence, watch out. You set yourself up for some sort of problem. Yeah. But... Caleb, who has a different spirit, and Caleb, he is now 80 years old because he's had to wander around in the wilderness with all of those other guys that were full of fear, not faith, and they were all perishing in the wilderness. Can you imagine? You've got the faith to enter in. You've got the faith to lay hold of what God has for you. But because, you know, the people around you don't have faith, then you have to walk with them for a wilderness. You know, and you, you, it's just like, could you all drop dead already so I can just get in? <laughs> And so at the end of the, that 40 years, Caleb is now 80. The Joshua, because Joshua had the same spirit as Caleb, they now enter into the promised land. They're following the angel of the Lord. We already talked about that. And now they, after a number of victories, they start to divide the territory to different tribes. And Caleb is of the tribe of Judah. And so they say, okay, where, what, what land do you want? And so Caleb says, do you remember the big mountains? Where the Nephilim live. The, the Nephilim are highly demonized giants. They're not ordinary men. Highly demonized people. Uh, give me the mountains where the Nephilim live with their Nephilim strongholds. And that's the sort of faith that Caleb has. Give me that mountain. I'll take on the strong men. I'll take on the strongholds of the enemy. And so... The thing is, though, we've got to learn how to speak to these strongholds. We've got to speak to these mountains of opposition. We've got to speak to, you know, as David spoke to Goliath, and Goliath was trying to intimidate David and try to fill David's heart with fear by getting David to focus on David. Mm -hmm. David, you are like a little dog mm -hmm. in comparison to me. I'm going to eat you like bread. So this is the enemy's strategy. Anti-faith is you look at yourself and compare yourself to the task. So the enemy is intimidating him. I'm going to eat you. I'm going to devour you. You're going to be finished. I'm going to grind your bones to dust. And, and David says, his reply is, I don't come against you with a sword or a shield or a javelin, but I come against you with the name of the Lord of hosts and he will hand you over to me. Yeah. And so David was speaking to the mountain. He was speaking yeah. against Goliath. Yeah. And he was focused on God and the power of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the angelic powers that was actually with him to defeat Goliath. And so then God anointed him and he had the little tiny stone. He put it in a sling, just a little stone. And with that little stone, he slew the giant Goliath. Yeah. And see, faith comes on stones and they become missiles. Yes. Little things like a little prayer or the little things that we do, but when we do them by faith and obedience, when God puts his hand on a little stone, it wipes out giants. Yes. And it's not the little stone that killed the, the giant. It was the hand of God released yes. by the faith of David. Amen. And that's what it says. So when you speak against the mountain, you've got to start to stir up the faith. This, the faith doesn't come by looking at yourself. And it definitely doesn't come by sitting down and meditating on how scary the giant looks. You know, how big is the Antichrist or how big is the agenda that's going on? Or, you know, all these things. Faith doesn't come from that. Fear will come from that if that's your primary focus. It comes by gazing upon the Lord, worshipping the Lord, praising the Lord, being impressed with the Lord, 
And then you actually start to compare the Lord to whatever that mountain is. And it's like that mountain, it's just a little tiny hill. Yes. Okay. So the Greek word for speak, because we're going to speak to the mountain. The Greek word is legio. Legio. So if you've got little kids, or when you were a little kid, and you bought them Legos. You know, the little Lego blocks. Well, that word Lego comes from the Greek legio. And legio literally means that you get all these different pieces and you pull them together and make this structure. Okay, that's what legio means. So it doesn't mean just be removed in Jesus name. Amen. Finished. No, it's actually you're going to have to look at the word of God. You're going to have to look at what are the declarations and the decrees and the promises that are in the Word of God, you stand in agreement as in comparison to this mountain that is opposing you. And then you will constantly get these different words and you're going to pull them together and make declarations and you're going to come like a battering ram until you see that mountain removed. That's what we used to have a saying very popular in the church. You don't hear it much nowadays, but it's a, a wisdom of God. They would say you need to pray through your breakthrough. In other words, if you just pray one prayer and it doesn't happen and you give up and walk away, well, you're pretty useless because the, the whole context, you have to believe that what you say will happen and it will, is that you continue to legio. You continue to pull together all these different thoughts and concepts that are the word of God and you continue to come like a battering ram against this gate of hell that's opposing your whatever the situation is that you need to overcome. And so it's speaking what God says, the power of the tongue. And a lot of people focus on, you know, the power of the tongue is the power of life and death. Proverbs says, you know, tongue is very powerful and you can curse people or you can bless people with your tongue. And there's a lot of people have to go for inner healing because, you know, the uh, their mum and dad used to get really angry at them, especially mums, because they're very verbal and they say lots of stuff. Uh, and so as you're growing up, you actually have to get healed from all of these words that come from angry mums and dads, you know, or angry school teachers. And there's curses that are released. So watch out, you school teachers. I've got a school teacher laughing. There you go, you know. So make sure you bless and don't curse, okay? And, uh, and all your mums and dads, you know, except you forget it when you're really angry. So then you're going to go back and repent to God and repent to your kids. But anyway. And they repent, so I break the power of those words in Jesus' name. You know? um, but the thing is, there's power, especially, and, and James, the little brother of Jesus, he's like for real is the brother of Jesus. His mum's Mary and Joseph. Okay, yeah. James, that's why I like the book of James. It's like he knew Jesus when Jesus was a carpenter. He knew Jesus, the big brother. He knew, you know, Jesus used to probably help change his nappies. <laughs> Very practical book, James. And James says there is a fire that is consuming a whole forest. It starts as a spark. It destroys a whole forest. Mm. And that fire is of your tongue. Mm. And that fire is lit from hell itself. Mm. We don't realize that when we get really angry and we start speaking over our marriage or speaking over our spouse, we are literally releasing spirit power and we are cursing our spouse. And by the way, when you're married, when you're angry and you curse your spouse, you curse yourself. You know why? Because the two are one. Yeah. Spiritual realities. You're cursing your marriage. Yeah. Better make sure you pull those weeds up by the root. Put out that fire. Amen? Amen. But you see, we've got to be aware of these uh, spiritual principles. But people focus a lot on the power to curse. And we're con our life is constantly, oh, there I go again. You know, like, just made another mistake. But let's focus today on the power to bless. Mm. The power to actually establish in a person's life the kingdom of God by speaking the things of God. And us speaking over ourselves, find out what God has promised and speaking over our own life over and over again. Mm. The promises of God until we see that mountain that's in us, whatever mountain of fear or worry or anxiety, you know, the mountain of depression, the mountain of discouragement, the mountain of defeat, whatever that mountain is in you, speak against that mountain, the promises of God. And break the power of that mountain and then speak the mountain of the Lord into your life, the holy mountain. 
the mountain of the Lord's purpose and kingdom. Speak faith. Speak life. Speak peace. Our words have power. Yes. And um, bigger challenges when we talk about cities and nations, we're going to have to, as it says, Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says, I give you the, the power and the authority to bind and to loose. I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom, he says. The keys of the kingdom unlock spiritual doors. The doors of heaven, so heaven manifests in the earth and in our lives. He says, I give you the keys of the kingdom. What you bind in the earth will be bound in heaven. In other words, we speak in and bind in, in the earth realm and in the spiritual realm, because the word heaven doesn't just mean the third heaven where God is. It's also where the angels and the demons are. That's the heavens, second heaven. And in and the second heaven, things start to get bound up because we are binding them with our tongue. And then we start to loosen things, which means to release things. He said, what you loosen in the earth, be loosed in the heavens. And he goes on, he says, when two or three of you gather together in agreement, the key to agreement is not so much that we agree with each other, it's that we agree with the Lord and what the Lord's will is for a situation. That's why you've got to study the Word of God and understand the will of the Lord, the will of the Lord for your marriage, the will of the Lord for your children, the will of the Lord for our nation, the will of the Lord in regards to your work situation. And, and so when two or three gather, they're in agreement with the Lord and therefore they're one with each other because they're all in agreement with the Lord. Then he says, whatever you ask, it will be given and I will be with you, Jesus says. That, that, that's a corporate witness. We know Jesus is in us by the Holy Spirit. But Jesus turns up in the meeting when we're all in agreement with Him, in agreement with each other, and we are now speaking. He says, whatever you ask, that's prayer. Yeah. Binding and loosening authority is released through speaking yeah. to the Lord and also speaking into the spiritual realm. And by the way, I will show you some examples of Scripture. We're speaking into people's lives. We're binding and loosening authority. Okay. So, the key verse, let's start with Matthew 16. Very common scripture that we have to look at in Lions War House of Prayer. But I want to focus on something specific in this Matthew 16. This is where Jesus originally speaks of sowing and reaping. Verse 18, and so Jesus said, I say to you that you are Peter, this little stone, but on this rock, and the rock is Christ. So we've just seen Jesus is asking, who do you say I am? Peter says, you're the Messiah, the anointed one of God. You are the son of God. And then Jesus says, well, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because God revealed this to you. And when you get the revelation of who Jesus is and you get the revelation of what he is saying, the revelation of his word, and then you are in agreement with that, then that's the context here. On this rock, the rock is Christ, I will build an ecclesia. Ecclesia is a government. That's what that word means, the government of of the city. You know the Sanhedrin that was in Jerusalem? Sanhedrin is the Jewish word for ecclesia. The ecclesia held both governmental power and they were also the law courts of the city. The government and the law courts. That was the Sanhedrin, that was the ecclesia. And so Jesus says, I'm going to build in the earth a representation of my government. And they will also be a representation of my law courts. So a lot of you have studied with me the law courts of heaven, the throne room of God from where God rules as king over all, his judge over all. And unless you understand the, the legal protocols of God as judge, you'll never move into kingdom authority. So we've got to understand God does judge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, and you can't and the word in the Hebrew for ruling 
is actually the same word used to judge. Okay, so that's important if we want to move in kingdom authority. Um, so blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. God revealed this, not men. And on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail. And then he says, and now I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and what you bind in the earth will be bound in heaven. What you loosen in the earth will be loosened in heaven. Okay, so the Greek word for to bind is dio, dio. And the Greek word for loose is luo. Okay, and again, if any Greek people here, just I really apologize. I'm really probably pronouncing this terrible. Okay, but dio and luo. Now that's important to know because these are both legal words used by the government and used by the law courts. This was, when Jesus uses these words, they're, they're known words. The Sanhedrin would use these concepts of binding and loosening. So to bind literally means with legal authority, I do not allow this. With legal authority, I, I do not allow it. I declare this as illegal. When something was bound, it was legally bound in that uh, it's like the, the activity of that thing now, all of the government and all of the government agents would, would work in that city to stop that activity from taking place. And anyone that is involved with that activity would be arrested, fined, or put in prison. Okay? The word loose is to legally allow or to release or to set free. Um, and, and as a law courts of heaven, we the church are an ecclesia, God's representatives. What is it that God wants to bind in people's lives? In other words, what is God legally not allowing? What has God declared and decreed as illegal activity? And what has God decreed and declared as legal activity? Now, what is it that he wants to release in the earth? Um, so the teaching today is on binding and loosening. I want you to listen carefully because I don't want you just to be hearers. I want you to be doers. And remember the prophetic word that we had of the revelation of the Lord of hosts. That, that God wants us to move from knowing Jesus as Saviour, my Saviour, to Jesus being my Lord. And the difference is, if we only know Jesus as our Saviour, we're always looking to Jesus to bless us, to free us, to help us. And then we're looking at you know, other Christians to bless us, to encourage us, to help us. That's Jesus as Saviour. I'm always, I'm always looking to get helped. But when we understand and know Jesus as Lord, we now join his army. We join his ecclesia. We join his government and we can exercise his authority and we can start to be ministers to others, to set them free and to bind up demons, etc. And so this is moving into lordship understanding. Um, you might have heard it, if you've been hanging around the church for a long time, when people pray, and I often will say this, I bind and break this activity. Um, that is because the word um, dio for to bind can also be dealing with to break or destroy. To break or destroy. Okay. Now the word luo for loosen has some very interesting applications. Um, <clears throat> You know, in fact, the word in the Greek, in the Hebrew for covenant is barith. A covenant is a binding contract. The greatest covenant is our covenant with God, where we barith, we actually get bound. So that's binding in a good sense. We get bound to God through covenant. Yeah. Uh, when you get married... There is a spiritual dynamic that happens. It doesn't happen when you just live together. When you get married before the Lord, there is a spiritual binding, a barith, because you've entered covenant. 
The man and the woman are bound in the spirit. That's why you have the wedding ring. It shows that you're bound together. It says the two become one, Scripture says. But the word luo, loose, can, is, is translated divorce. So whenever you read the word divorce in the New Testament, that's to loosen. Because you've loosened yourself from a binding covenant. Okay? And it can be used in a positive sense. Some of you may have heard people pray where there has been, because in our history in the Western world and also in many nations where you have ungodly religions that worship other gods and deities. So what happens is that through uh, the other worship systems, they also enter into binding covenants with their gods. So whether it's Buddhism or Hinduism or, you know, the Dreamtime spirits of the Aboriginals, well, there's also these, this Dreamtime, the Rainbow Serpent, all that sort of stuff that goes on. These are not Yahweh. These are not the true and living God. And through those belief systems, they bind themselves to those spiritual powers. And so um, one of the, the, the spirits or one of the, the uh, it's more than a spirit, it's a power or principality called Baal. So Freemasonry, they have two names for the god of Freemasonry. And one is Jarbelon, which is they, they mix Jehovah with Baal, Jarbel, and then the god of Egypt. But literally, um, the system of Freemasonry is, is a Baal worship system. The other name that they've got for God is Apollyon, which means the destroyer. It turns up in Revelation, you know, um, very powerful demonic being. And so in Freemasonry, they make vows and oaths to the God of Freemasonry. And in the beginning, they think that, you know, that you're a Christian God, so you're doing it to Christian God. But actually, in the end, it's Lucifer. That's the final revelation that they actually worship Satan. And so we've got a, in the Western world, we've got a group of people that move behind governments. The Masonic order is very powerful, especially from the British throne and nations linked in with the British throne. And, and a lot of people that are high up in government and high up in the law courts and even the police force are involved with the Masons. And so they have bound themselves to this Jarbelon. Who is Baal? And because of that, in a lot of our nations, there is a covenant, like a covenant of marriage between the people, the land, and Baal. And so that's why you may hear people in spiritual warfare, and I use this term, we would divorce the land and its people from Baal. Okay, so instead of saying we loosen, we use a stronger word, we divorce. And you could use that for people that when uh, I was ministering to Buddhists and Buddhists uh, would make the decision to follow Jesus. And I'd explain, you know what? If you really want to become a Christian, you can't follow the Buddha and follow Jesus at the same time. I'll give them a little example. I'll just say, just imagine you've got to get from this side of the river to the other side of the river. And there's two boats. And you've got to make a decision. Am I going to jump in the Buddha boat or the Jesus boat, right? And, but you can't make your choice. You want to actually be, you know, both. And so you put one foot in the Buddha boat, one foot in the Jesus boat. The problem is they're going in different directions. And so you end up in the water and, you know, you're in trouble. And, uh, and so the thing is that there has to be a divorce. There has to be a breaking of the covenant with whatever God that you have made a vow to be married to. You, you don't literally use that term, but that's what we're talking about. There's a thing um, called uh, soul ties. And so when we do inner healing ministry, we address the issue of soul ties. So what soul ties is, uh, primarily, is if in your past life that you have had sexual relationship with anyone, male or female, outside of the marriage covenant, because it's outside of marriage, it's not sanctified. It doesn't have God's hand of blessing on it. And so in the triangle of covenant, the, the man or the woman or the man and the man or whatever the combination is going on, the third place, if it's outside of God's order, Satan sits in that place. It's not blessed of the Lord. The enemy actually now comes into that covenant. 
And so soul ties, literally, again, the scripture says the two become one. And it's not just your bodies coming together in sex. Your soul connects with the other person's soul. And there is a connection where you get bound soullessly with each other. It's called a soul tie. And, uh, and through soul ties, then what happens is, you know, maybe you break up in the natural and you try to move on to another relationship, but you're actually carrying spiritually or soulishly with you that other person. Mm. And, uh, and it can now defile future marriage. Mm. And so <clears throat> soul ties is something that you need to identify. Why? Because you've been bound soulishly to another person and it's not sanctified and the enemy's going to be able to use that until you break the soul tie. Yeah. And so, you know, so I bind and break this soul tie in Jesus' name. Mm. I loosen myself from this soul tie in Jesus' name. You can name the person, you know. I loosen myself from my soul tie with such and such. And uh, when you learn this, you won't have to just run up to Pastor Glenn and Hyun Mi or something. Could you pray for me? I realize I've got a soul tie. You know what? If you listen carefully today, mm. you can start to pray this over yourself. Amen. And you'll keep praying it until it's totally broken. So remember, you've got a legio. You've got to keep praying these things. Don't just pray one time. Until you see this soul tie totally broken, yeah. you keep praying it through. You keep speaking against that mountain. Okay, But, but you once you learn these principles... Uh, and, and I'll often do it. I don't. Sometimes you don't have opportunity, you, you, you know, that you're at work or something and you can't pick up the phone and call the pastor. And even if you did, he might not answer because uh, he might be doing gym or something. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, once you learn this, if you're struggling, for example, with depression for some reason, I don't know why, but I'm struggling under this depression. It's like I'm being attacked with these very negative, depressing thoughts. You know, how do you name a demon, by the way? Is it like Beelzebub or, you know, what? how do you name a demon? Look at activity. Because in Jesus, he says, you know, the spirit of infirmity. And he said this, I loosen this woman from the spirit of infirmity. And the Pharisees got really upset with Jesus because he did this on the Sabbath. And they go, you're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. He's setting people free from demons, you know. And they're all, they're, because this is the religious spirit. Oh, how dare you come into the synagogue and cast out a demon out of somebody? And, you know, how dare you heal somebody on the Sabbath? And, you know, that's how twisted they were in their religion. And so Jesus rebukes them and he says, you know, here is a daughter of our father Abraham in the covenant with Yahweh. And she is being bound... That word there, she is being dio, she's been bound by this demonic spirit of infirmity 18 years. And today, this holy day, I've set her free, and you're more angry that I did this than being happy that she's set free. You guys are twisted. Well, he didn't really say it that way, but modern translation. You know, what's wrong with you? But there's those terms. This woman has been bound by a spirit of infirmity. And scripture says she was bound over like this. It actually, that demon that bound her caused her physical deformity. And she'd seen doctor after doctor after doctor. And none of them could help her because sometimes the root of some sickness that's in our life is not natural. There are some sicknesses that have a demonic spiritual root and only when that demonic spiritual root is addressed, you speak to that thing in Jesus' name, you bind and break its power and you loosen the person from it. And until that's done, no amount of medicine is going to help. There's another time and there's a man, he was deaf and dumb. So dumb doesn't mean stupid. It means he can't talk. Mm. Okay, just letting you know. <laughs> and um, so Jesus, this man that's deaf and dumb, comes to Jesus for help. And, and Jesus comes along and, and does, you know, only that Jesus could ever get away with. If I did that, I'd probably be arrested or something. You know, he puts his finger in the ears and, you know, ears be opened. And then he spits and puts it on the guy's tongue. And it says that he, he said, be loosened. The man's tongue was loosened 
so that he could speak. And he used that be loosened prayer. In other words, that man may have been deaf and dumb because of a demonic spirit. And by the way, it says in the Old Testament, those that worship idols, idols have eyes that don't see, ears that don't hear, and a tongue that doesn't speak. And it's very interesting, when I was up in the mountains of Nepal, when I first started missions uh, in that part of the world, and, and up in the mountains, there's an incredibly high percentage of people that were deaf and dumb. I thought, this is bizarre. And then someone said to me um, that it's one of the curses that comes from idolatry. Now, there's two types of death and dumbness, okay? Mm. Two types. One, which is very extreme, where the demonic spirits have actually caused the person no longer to be able to hear or speak. And then the other one, it's less obvious, but everyone that worships idols gets this one. They spiritually start to become deaf and dumb. They spiritually can't hear the voice of God. They spiritually, there's a, a spiritual deafness that starts to take place. And so you can come to people like that and I would bind up this deaf and dumb spirit and I would loosen you and set you free from its power in Jesus' name. Amen. This is how you can do this stuff. And, and you know, you can pray over people even for the other thing, you know, um, the spiritual deaf and dumb. I, I would just... Right now, bind up any deaf and dumb spirit that's causing you to spiritually suffer from spiritual death and dumbness. Mm. And I would loosen you from that. And in Jesus' powerful name, I would open your eyes and open your ears. Mm. And, you know, that's in the Bible. Paul said that. May God give you a spirit of revelation and may God open the eyes of your heart. Mm. Did you know your heart has eyes? Your heart has ears. That's your spirit man. Yeah. So you can be seeing and hearing with your natural body, but your spirit man is blind and deaf. And so Paul was praying that prayer, may your spiritual eyes be opened. Elisha prayed that over his servant. He couldn't see the angelic powers. He could only see the natural realm. He had no spiritual insight. He said, Lord, open his eyes. And that's the kind of this thing, the binding, loosening type of dynamic. Opening and closing things. So the word loosen, because the word bound means that someone has become a slave, a prisoner, or a captive. And it's actually that word in the Greek is used in other parts of the Bible when they were, when they were thrown in prison and they were bound in chains. And they became a prisoner, and that word there, they're captive, and this comes out of the word for to bind. So it's interesting. We're binding the enemy, but you know what? The enemy's activities, we've already seen two examples. The enemy can bind us. The enemy binds people. He restricts them from being free to do what God is saying. Uh, but we can, when we start to understand that we're being restricted, held down, or held back, we can break the power of that in Jesus' name. We can pray over one another. It doesn't have to be myself or Hyunmi. All of us can share what we're going through in life. And here it is. When you share what you're going through in life, try to get some names to describe what you're struggling with. This is how simple it is. And, and, and this is how I used to do counselling. Everyone thought I was amazing trained. You know, I wasn't. Um, <laughs> one, of, one of the keys is when you don't really know what you're doing, just pr pretend, look like you do. Fake it. Yeah, fake it, you know. But this is all, this is all I did is I'd, I'd sit down with them and I'd say, what is it in your life that you're struggling with? And they would start to talk through. And you've got to make sure, do not give me, I was born on such and such a day, da, 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 and, and, and don't give me like a, the, the five-hour version. Because <laughs> um, some people will do that. i tell you what, they go and it's incredible. Give me an overview. What is it in your life that you are struggling with? And, and, you know, and I'll ask them some specific questions. You know, what are you struggling with in your marriage? What are you struggling with your children? Uh, what are you, how are you struggling in your faith? Um, are you struggling with anything uh, in your physical body? Are you struggling with finances? So I'll, I'll be, uh, you, you've got to be a good question person and you've got to ask a lot of questions. 
And then you just simply listen to what they say and start to write it down. Oh, yeah, look, um, I'm feeling really, you know, um, a- apathetic and discouraged and I feel really hopeless. Oh, apathy, discouraged, hopeless. This is simple like that. And you just listen to them share of what they're struggling through and then pray. You go through your list that you wrote down and say, I would bind and break off of your life every spirit of apathy. I bind and break off of your life discouragement. And I bind and break off of your life hopelessness in Jesus' name. Okay? And then you think godly positive opposites. Okay, well, they're feeling very apathetic. Well, I I would pray, I would loosen over you an an enthusiasm, a spirit that comes from the Lord, that that would fan into flame the gift of God that's in you. I would loosen over you instead of hopelessness, I would release over you the hope of the Lord, that a spirit of hope would fill your life. And where you've been discouraged, I would pray that the Lord would fill you with courage and strength in Jesus' name. And so it's, it's this simple... So please listen to this. If you start to do this, even you can do it with yourself. You know, you come home one day, okay, what is it that I'm actually going through? I'm feeling really low. Um, just try to get some words to describe what you're going through. Now, this is easier for women than men. And I'm not joking, okay? Even though I'm very sarcastic and I say sarcastic things. But actually, women are very, very professional probably too much, of sharing their feelings. So I tell you what, sit down with a woman. I'll sit down with my wife. Five hours later, I've got like a book written of what I've got to bind and lose. You know? <laughs> and, and men, it's just like, oh, I feel bad. Just don't feel good today. Okay? So, so women are a lot better at verbalising Emotions, especially the emotional things. Um, And they have a lot of practice. The problem is that they never ever get bind up what's going on and never loosen themselves. They just jump on the merry-go-round and they're going, I'm going to just talk about it more and more. I'm going to speak to the mountain, life. Mm. You know, hopelessness, depression, life, get worse in my life. And I'm going to just keep grumbling and complaining, you know. So you've got to learn how to, it's not just speaking and sharing, it's got to, you've got to deal with this thing, Okay. Yes, it's good. Women are like these pressure cookers. If they don't get to share, they'll explode. So watch out. <laughs> and so you, you get the pressure cooker and you start to release and let them start to share. Start to write down. If you're a husband here, listen carefully. It'll save you explosion experiences. And then once the pressure's gone, well, the pressure cooker can open it up, right? Yes. And, and then we can start to deal with things. The problem with men... Men don't know how to depressurize. They don't know how to share their emotions. And that's why men will explode in life. That's why men explode in marriage. It comes a time. Now, you either explode or you implode. So I'm a bit of an imploder. I've got to watch it. So I internalize stuff. And, and then that will come out with all sorts of sickness in your body and migraines and all sorts of stuff goes on when you implode. The exploder people, actually exploder people are usually uh, easier to work with because even though it comes out in a bad way, you know what's going on. Yeah. Okay, the imploder people is like, could you please share with me? Please say something. <laughs> so, so with men, um, I want to encourage you guys to probably seek the Lord and ask for, an, for his help. To be able to start to find, how can I name what I'm going through? How to put a, a word to this? And, um, and, and you guys can help each other. It's because when you name what the mountain is, when you name this thing, then you can have authority to break it. And, uh, and so that's really important uh, to look through. Um, in Isaiah 58, can we just go there? Now, a lot of people, they're like, uh, it says in 1 Corinthians 13, you know, um, you look in the mirror, you walk away and forget what you just saw, okay? 
And so I'm speaking this morning, and some of you are going to hear, and you're kind of like you're seeing yourself in the mirror. So, oh my goodness, you know, I've got something I've got to work on here. But, you know, after the meeting, you jump in the car and you forget. Okay? Um, so, what I'm sharing this morning, I want to really speak to you as a community as you build, build kingdom relationships with each other, but also remind one another of this. Okay? Don't just try to remind yourself, but remind one another. Hey, remember what Pastor Glenn was speaking about on Sunday, about the binding, the loosening? You know, us men, we really have a hard time sharing what we're going through, getting a, how, do, how do we describe it, how do we give a name to it? You know, um, let's have a sit down and just let's try to have a conversation and try to work out, can we name some of this stuff? And, uh, and so the, the more you do this, the stronger you get. Okay, so Isaiah 58 it's about the type of fast that really pleases God. And uh, it says in verse 1, Cry aloud, sp spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. So that's the word of God to the prophet Isaiah. Um, they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinances of their God. They asked me on a regular occasion to, for my justice, and they take a, a delight in approaching me. Now, this sounds like a really spiritual group of people. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. Like, listen to it. It's like, they seek the Lord daily. They delight to know his ways. They're a nation, a people that does righteousness. Um, they do not forsake the commands of God. Uh, they ask God for his justice. They delight to come into the, the meetings and everything. Wow. And then it says, the next verse, they say, why have we fasted but not seen any results? Why have we been afflicted in our souls and you, O oh Lord, take no notice? We're, so there, there are people that are doing all these things and now they're fasting and praying and, and God's not giving them breakthrough. They're not getting set free. And so they start going, well, that was pretty useless. You know, every Wednesday night I turn up to the, you know, the home group and every Sunday morning I turn up at church. I even turn up on Saturday night for prayer and, you know, and I'm listening to praise and worship songs all the time on my CD player and, uh, and it's, but no, it doesn't work. Mm. Okay. So in fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit your laborers. So this is what's happening here. Double-mindedness. Mm. They're doing all these spiritual things, going to church, going to prayer meetings, fasting and praying, singing all the good songs. Meanwhile, you know, they're running a business and they're ripping off people with their wages. Mm. We love justice and righteousness for, for me, but not for others. <laughs> okay? Oh, forgiveness is awesome for me. But I want judgment for you. Mm. Yeah. I really need to be forgiven. I need people to really understand me. But I'm not going to forgive you. <laughs> That's what's going on here. Yeah. Okay? And, 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 and so there's, there's strife. Even though they go to church and do all these things, they're constantly exploding, losing their temper, they're cursing people, and they're you know, killing people with their tongue, and all this sort of stuff's going on. And they go to church and they sing hallelujah. Now they're wondering why they're not getting their spiritual breakthrough. And it goes on. Um, Indeed you fast for strife and debate. They think it's spiritual, all the arguments they get into, and you know the judgment that they have when they judge other people. They think they're being spiritual because they've got discernment, but it's not discernment. It's just judging in a negative, ungodly way. So their righteousness is twisted. Okay? And it goes on. Verse 5, okay, this is the fast I, the Lord, have chosen. A day for a man to afflict his own soul. It's when you look at yourself and you judge yourself with a righteous judgment and you start to really deal with your issues. Uh, it is to bow down his head like a bulrush, to spread out uh, sackcloth and ashes. Um, would you call this a fast and acceptable to the Lord? So here is the chosen fast of the Lord. To loosen the bonds of wickedness off others, to undo their heavy burdens, and to set the oppressed free, that you would break every yoke. 
Okay. So all of the stuff, they should have done all that good stuff, but also they need to watch how they are relationally with others. And that their goal is actually, I want to bless and set free. I want to build up and not destroy. I want to encourage and not discourage. They've got to have that attitude. And then your prayer and your fasting will have power. Okay. Very powerful scripture. And we've looked at this a couple of times in the different meetings over the last couple of days or last couple of weeks. But in our Revelation 14, 18, let's have a look at that. Revelation chapter 14, verse 18. And so another angel came out from the altar. Uh, this angel had power over the fire. Now, this is a seraphim, by the way. So... The cherubim are the throne guardians of God. They guard the throne. The seraphim are the golden altar guardians. And the golden altar of heaven is the place of where the prayers of the saints and the praise and the worship of the saints is offered up to God. And the seraphim, the, the name seraphim means the burning ones. So I believe this is a seraphim because an angel comes from where? The golden altar. He's a guardian of the golden altar. It means that he's moving because of response to prayer. The, the saints have been praying that, re, that moves the angel that has power over fire. And that's Isaiah 6, we saw the other week, where the seraphim comes to Isaiah, touches his lips and cleanses him by the fire of heaven. That's the seraphim come either to bring judgment of fire or cleansing by fire. That's their two roles. Um, and so... He comes out uh, with this mighty fire and he starts to declare thrust in the sharp sickle. And this is dealing with the harvest of souls. But what I want to say is there is an angel loosened from the altar of incense because the saints have been crying out to God. Our voice when we are in agreement with the will of God, has great power. It moves angels. Yes. Okay. Um, if we look at Revelation 20, chapter 20, verse 1 and 2. Then I saw another angel. He was coming down from heaven. He had keys. Isn't that interesting? We've been given the keys of the kingdom. Now this angel is being given the key of the kingdom. And he's got the key to the bottomless pit. Ooh. And he has a great chain in his hand. And he lays hold of that dragon who is the serpent of old, who is the devil, also called Satan. So here is, here's a mighty angel. He's given by God the key of the kingdom. And it's the key to unlock the abyss, the bottomless pit. And it's also being given this huge chain. And he grabs Satan. You know, as big and terrifying as we think Satan and the devil is, there's this one angel grabs him, <laughs> binds him with this chain. And that's what the word is to bind. And it says um, he, he binds him and shuts him up. And sets a seal on him that he should not deceive the nations anymore till the thousand years are over. But at the end of the thousand years, he was loosened. Now, this is interesting because you see a demonic power being bound. This is Satan at the end of the age or loosened. There's other scriptures in the book of Revelation that talk about these huge angels that are around the river Euphrates. And these angels have been bound throughout history for thousands of years. These huge, powerful demons that cannot operate outside of a small region, suddenly they are loosened because God sends angels to loosen them to bring judgments. So I'm just trying to get you to think binding and loosening with angel activity. You know, there are times that we are exercising authority to bind up demonic powers and demonic activities yeah. over churches and regions and as we're praying these prayers, the angels of God are sent because of our prayers with these chains that come from heaven and they're binding up these demonic powers so that those demonic powers can no longer be active. Amen. 
But we also have authority to pray and to loosen angelic armies into activity. So I want you to think about these, these concepts that are there with binding and loosening. When we just minister to individual people, it's that, you know, whatever they're struggling through, we bind that up and then we loosen it. We want to release into their life. I, I release into your life uh, that grace and peace of the Lord would be increasing. I release the spirit of wisdom. I release the spirit of understanding. And so by releasing, that's another way of saying loosening. The word uh, luo can be to, to loosen. Okay, so what I want you to think about too. Okay, what, what people struggle with? Addictions. So I want you to think about this and pray about this. And go home, maybe write it down and start to pray through your list. Maybe seek someone else out from the church and say, would you mind sitting down with me and uh, let's have a conversation. I want you to agree with me because where two or three agree, there's power. Okay? So, you know, do you have addictions in your life? The scripture talks about being bound by sin. We can get bound up by certain sin, which is an addiction. It has us bound. We're not free. From that thing. But, you know, we can pray and we can break that which binds us in Jesus' name. Uh, infirmities and sicknesses. Again, there's some sicknesses that people are struggling with. It can be emotional sicknesses, mm. mental sicknesses. And some of these sicknesses have spiritual roots. Not There are, obviously, there's, you know, if you fall over and break your leg, it's because you fell over and broke your leg. Don't you? A spirit broke my leg. You know, <laughs> no. You know, you fell over. But you know, but there are some people that have a curse, they're accident prone. And it's like, oh my goodness, here we go again. It's like it's not they didn't fall over one time, it's like they fall over all the time. You've broke their leg last week and they're breaking their arm this week, and you know, a couple of weeks ago, you know, they break their shoulder and you know that accident prone where it's like a constant thing? Yeah. Well, when it's a one off, you know, you don't have to suspect the activity of the enemy. But when they're under this, you know, oh my goodness, you know, like they had another car accident. And then, oh my goodness, now, you know, like they lost the wallet with a hundred dollars. It's like everything goes wrong with these people. It's because they're under a curse. This is how you identify curses. It's constant recurring things. Now that that definitely will have a demonic root. So if they did fall over and break their leg, a demon probably put his foot out and tripped them. Because it's something that happens all the time. And, and you'll meet people like that. It's like, I don't know why, but with finances, I'm always suffering loss. I never have enough. Even though my income is good, it's just like, it's, um, like my purse has a hole in it. In fact, the Bible talks about a curse that is like your purse has a hole in it. And your finances just disappear. Well... You can take authority in Jesus' name, but you've got to recognize the issue. You take authority in Jesus' name and break the power of the curse over your finances. Mm. But then also you need to loosen, and I would loosen over each one of you right now, a spirit of wisdom and counsel and understanding that you'd come to understand the source or the reason why that curse is there in the first place. Yes, yes. So like Jesus who prayed for that sick person and healed them of their sickness... And then, uh, as I was walking away, Jesus says, Now go and sin no more, lest something worse come upon you. Yes. In other words, that sickness was in their life because in their life they didn't been involved with certain sinful activity. That sinful activity had caused the sin. And Jesus says, I'm now, as a grace, mercy thing, I've, I've healed you of your sickness. But if you go back and keep sinning, not only will you get the sickness again, it'll get worse. Okay, so that's why I pray for wisdom, because, you know, um, if you have a financial curse, it could be simply the fact that you do not have the wisdom of good stewardship. You don't know how to steward your money. And so, you know, as soon as you get money, you go off and you spend it all and it just disappears. So we can break the power of the curse over your finances. But if you just keep going out there and just buying whatever, it's like you reactivate. So you, we've got to have a wisdom where these things come from and deal with. That's where counselling and advice is very important. Okay. If you have a background in your life, and, and this group only has a couple of Westerners, but uh, anything to do with Freemasonry, because there's vows and oaths that are made through Freemasonry. And, and by the way, Freemasonry is closely linked to the Mormon church. The, 
Joseph Smith was a high-level Mormon. So Mormonism at the top, there's a lot of the same Masonic curses and things go on. And so um, think about what is your background outside of Jesus. You know, have you been involved with a religion, Buddhism, Hinduism, New Age? Um, do you come from communist China? In fact, do you, have you been to a university in Australia? Because Marxist socialism, yeah, no, it used to be communist China, now it's like, we're going to deal with this in Australia. Marxist socialism. A lot of the extreme left, it is a demonic spirit. Communism is antichrist. Can I tell you, I live yeah. in a communist country. Communism is vehemently antichrist. Karl Marx actually worshipped Satan. Wow. And he talks about this in one of his books. He wasn't a full atheist. He believed in Satan. Wow. And so where there is in our universities this socialism, Marxist socialism, it is a, there's a spirit behind that that generates an unholy, ungodly worldview which will start to bind you up and cause you not to be able to walk in the fullness of authority that you have in Christ Jesus. So, you know, you think about that. And by the way, if you've been to higher education, anyone that gets involved with higher education, here is a, a spirit. Now, years ago, I had a mentor. And some of you remember uh, Oriel Piper came and ministered deliverance in our church. Her father was my mentor. And her father was my father's mentor uh, when I started in missions. And um, uh, he gave me some really good advice. And he was explaining to me, whenever they minister to people that have been through higher education, mm -hmm. universities, and the higher you go up in universities, and this unfortunately includes now a lot of our theological seminaries. Yeah. Um, there is a spirit of rationalism mm -hmm. and intellectualism which will hinder you from being able to tap into the true spiritual power of God. Because what happens is you now with reasoning and logic analyze everything and you start to live in the soul realm of the mind. Yeah. And that becomes a stronghold that you start to disconnect from the spiritual life and power of God. And so anyone involved with uh, higher education needs to get uh, the stronghold and the spirit of intellectualism and rationalism broken off of their lives because this is why a lot of them, with university, Bible college seminaries even, they've studied theology, 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 and they come out of the seminary, it's kind of a cemetery, it's, it put yeah. death to their spiritual life. Amen. And so they have a head knowledge like the Pharisees of all of these spiritual things but they don't have a spiritual life encounter and they're not moving in the experience of these things. What a curse. And so that's one thing. Uh, anyone being involved with higher level education, you need to get deliverance from this. And if you're in high level education now, you need to guard yourself from this taking over. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so obviously anything to do with new age. Now, amazingly, when we talk about curses, we instantly look at Witchcraft, mm -hmm. Ooh. and you know, Satanism and New Age and stuff like that. But there's a lot of other things that are out there, like we just talked about the intellectualism thing that comes in, mm. um, and that the intellectual. That's why there's a lot of church denominations where, although they talk about God, they talk about angels, and they talk about demons. If you've had an encounter with a demon and you share that testimony with them, they think you're weird. Yeah. Because they don't really hold a biblical worldview. It's just, it's all intellectual. In fact, some of them go as far as saying, well, angels and demons aren't real. It's all psychosomatic. Okay. I've actually heard people say that in the church. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's, there's other things that we can be involved with in life that might uh, quench the spirit of God. And, and what these things do, they start to blind us. Mm. Yeah. We, we, we start, we, when you find your spiritual life disappearing because you're getting restricted and bound, you're finding your spiritual joy, your spiritual hope. Understand that there is something now in your life experience that is working against the fire of God burning in you powerfully. Mm -hmm. And so then what we need to do is we need to identify what these things are and we need to now speak against that mountain. We need to deal with those things. Okay. Definitely with sickness, it's, you know, just you sit down and, you know, what are the sicknesses that you're going through? What's... Ailing your body, and we can always at least pray over it. 
Even if it's not spiritual, you at least pray. Okay, and to deal with these things. So that's what I wanted to share this morning. Wow, awesome. I hopefully have equipped you, and it's going to be up to you now. Um, make sure you go and have some conversations with some, some other people that have been in the room. Um, go out, maybe have a cup of coffee or something, and just share with one another, ask for prayer. Um, the other thing that is, um, make sure you sit down with your little list and, and write through it. If there's things that you really need prayer for and you're not getting a breakthrough, then you can contact me. Um, we do have, and I'm training up, we've got a prophetic prayer ministry team in the church. We meet every Thursday night for training. And if there's enough people in the group that would like to receive ministry in the arena of binding and loosening ministry over these issues, you might have got your list together and everything and you, you say, okay, I need some extra help. Let me know and we can organize a Thursday night where you can come and we'll have teams of people praying with you, praying through these things. Mm -hmm. So that means that next Thursday, um, we're going to actually have a guest speaker next Thursday, but the Thursday after, um, we'll be doing training with the prophetic ministry prayer team on binding and loosening that they really know what they're doing before you come in. Um, and by, by saying that, next Thursday, Nicholas... Prophet Nicholas is going to be with us. He's going to be speaking about um, the Joel's army, the end time army dynamic of what is it at the end of the age. And then we're going to be having a time of activation of the end time army activation. Um, so I'm just going to finish there. If anything major has come up and you do need some help or prayer, please just contact me and uh, definitely I will pray with you. Okay. Um, from what we talked about today. So you don't want to open up a can of worms and just leave people running around with a can of worms. Yeah. You know, I heard one person say it's like taking you to a surgery, you open them up and their guts are all hanging out and then you walk away and say, good luck, see you next week. Um, so if there's any major issue, yes, uh, contact me um, or you might just find someone else that you trust in the group and say, hey, could you just pray with me today? Because I want to really activate you all as ministers. I don't want everyone looking to me like I'm Jesus. I'm not Jesus. I can really assure you that I'm really trying to catch up with that guy. He's awesome. Um, I'm on a journey just as you are. But um, that, that Jesus is in me and Jesus is in you too. And we've got to learn how to release the power of Christ. And that's what it means to be a minister. So, Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. I thank you for the worship, which was really going off. I don't know. I was really getting to the third heaven. and <laughs> I was seeing angel warriors, and they're all beating war drums, and the angel legions preparing for war. And it's, I just had awesome worship this morning, better than any Marvel movie. Oh, and, uh, Lord. and, Lord, that um, I want to thank you that the, when we can tap into the reality of spiritual powers and, and what's going on in the heavens, Lord, it is something that is exciting. And, Lord, that we would get a greater hunger and excitement stirred up in our spirit about these things, I pray. And, and Lord, I do pray for each one here with what I was sharing in the subject of binding and loosening. That, Lord God, that you, by the power of your spirit, would just come upon them and just give them uh, wisdom and awareness. Are there things in their life that need to be addressed? Do they need to get set free from something? Um, Lord, uh, is there something that needs to be bound up in its activity in their lives? So I just want to put them in your hands, Lord, for you to be ministering to in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen.